Well, we're going through, and you know who's up now. The most iconic of all the chromatic dragons. It's time for the red dragon. The red dragon, um, without a doubt, the most iconic of the dragons in fantasy role-playing games, um, particularly D&D. And there's a whole history of red dragon storylines throughout different campaign settings because I think in part they're like an easy bad guy, right? Like no matter what scale, young, old, ancient, big, small, like red dragons are just, they've always been like the chaotic evil, fire-breathing death from above, right? So naturally, at any level, you can integrate a age and power appropriate, challenge rating appropriate red dragon into your campaign. But let's dig a little deeper to think about how we could use red dragons creatively. Maybe outside of the box, but you know, there's also nothing wrong with using them in their suggested settings. So let's take a look. The most covetous of the true dragons, red dragons tirelessly seek to increase their treasure hordes. They're exceptionally vain, even for dragons, and their conceit is reflected in their proud bearing and their disdain for other creatures. The odor of sulfur and pumice surrounds a red dragon whose swept back horns and spinal frill define its silhouette. Its beaked snout vents smoke at all times, and its eyes dance with flame when it's angry. Its wings are the longest of any chromatic dragon and have a blue-black tint along the trailing edge that resembles metal burned blue by fire. The scales of a red dragon wormling are a bright glossy scarlet turning a dull, deeper red and becoming as thick and strong as metal as the dragon ages. Its pupils also fade as it ages, and the oldest red dragons have eyes that resemble molten lava orbs. Now, that's a really cool description, right? And if you were to look back at, like, the first edition Monster Manual, um, like, your red dragon, your, your most epic of creatures, would have like two paragraphs for the entire thing. But, you know, rest assured in fifth edition, you get a lot more um, setting and, and descriptive elements here for you in your fifth edition monster manual. Let's talk about where they live. Let's talk about their interactions with others uh, and their motivations, because I think that can help a DM define how to use a red dragon in a game. Mountain masters. Red dragons prefer mountainous terrain, badlands, and any other locale where they can perch high and survey their domain. Their preference for mountains brings them into conflict with the hill-dwelling copper dragons from time to time. Red dragons fly into destructive rages and act on impulse when angered. They are so ferocious and vengeful that they are regarded as the archetypical evil dragon by many cultures. No other dragon comes close to the arrogance of the red dragon. These creatures see themselves as kings and emperors and view the rest of dragonkind as inferior believing that they are chosen by Tiamat to rule in her name. Red dragons consider the world and every creature in it as theirs to command. I think so far every dragon I've done, I've talked about ego being a factor. Uh, but I think red dragons, maybe particularly red dragons, um, might have the ego component, you know, for, for certain... Um, I don't know if they would have like the narcissistic component, but definitely the evil component and the ego. But when you think about it, you're like, all right, if they're living in like mountain ranges and near volcanoes, who are they coming across? I mean, other than what, what the book just referenced with, you know, regard to like copper dragons, who's really living in those areas? And I think when you think about the settings, where you would typically find a red dragon, it's almost like you have to go there to find it, right? Like it's almost like you, either you're like some mountain people and like, let's say you're, you know, a town in the mountains, nestled into the mountains. You wouldn't build a civilization in a place where there's a bunch of red dragons or frankly, even one red dragon. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So the way I think this could happen is you could have a mountainous area in your campaign where there is already a civilization. 
or maybe tribes or small villages clustered into the mountains, that kind of stuff. And maybe these mountain folk, you know, are, are they're fishing, they're, they're hunting, uh, I don't know, maybe they raise like mountain goats. I don't really know. But point is, is that you've got this, you know, these villages or this tribal group that are in the mountains already. And maybe they've been there for centuries and a dragon comes along. That's one way that you could start this off right away, is that your party is in that mountainous area for a totally different reason, right? Or maybe it's like a dwarven civilization that's built into the mountains and they, they have access to a valley and fresh water and you know, fertile land, but they're mining in the mountains. And then comes along a dragon. And with that basic setup, no matter what level you're at, you can integrate a red dragon. So I'm gonna go with like the lowest, you know, levels one through three. You could have them on some adventure to help liberate this abandoned dwarven mine from a nasty tribe of goblins. In that scenario, you could have a dragon come along who ultimately maybe takes over that mine for themselves, wipes out the goblins and the party runs away. Or maybe it's just a, a young red dragon who's looking to stake a claim for somewhere and is like, oh, this is convenient. There's already a nice mountain with perches and also a nice big open tunnel where I can go in and store all my treasure and I'll just destroy everyone there. But a red dragon wormling wouldn't, I don't think it makes sense that a red dragon wormling would be out by itself per se. So maybe in a larger regional sense, you have an adult red dragon who is not the first thing that your party's going to encounter, but the wormling could be like, you know, out for a little flight and comes across the party while they're traveling through the mountains or comes across the party while they're going to liberate the dwarven mines from the goblins or comes across the party while the party is on their way to somewhere else. They've stopped at this mountain village and they're, you know, it's like beautiful and like Switzerland and they're up in the mountains and people are skiing, I don't know. The idea being that you, you wanna kind of think first about what the motivation is. Why would there be dragons in that area? And if you are gonna scale it down and you're gonna have a low level adventure where you have a red dragon wormling, make that a story connection. So if the party kills that red dragon wormling, some adult red dragon who, you know, is fathered or mothered that birthed or sired, that um, wormling is going to eventually find out that their offspring is missing and they'll be pissed, which can come back to haunt the party later in the campaign, right? Like way later because um, adult red dragons are a challenge rating 17. But you could, you know, you could bridge that gap with a young red dragon, you know, who's out to prove themselves and to claim their own land. They've left the nest, so to speak and they're you know, f looking, surveying where they could possibly set up you know, their place. Um, and that's where you can integrate that into like your mid to lower high levels, you know, your six through 10 or even eight through 12 range um, to have that young red dragon encounter. And maybe the young dragon you know, fights the party and kills half of them and then claims the land while the others flee. Or maybe the party almost kills that young red dragon, young red dragon escapes, flies away, and then you bring that young red dragon back years later in the campaign. But I think that whole concept of a red dragon looking for territory in a mountainous region makes sense. And, and the book gives you a lot more information, and I'm not gonna read all of it, um, but in, in terms of like their motivations, they value wealth, so any concept of like the classical dragon horde, you know, the, the mountain of treasure, um, that's all gonna be kind of part of it. And that's not gonna be something that's sitting on top of a mountain peak, it's gonna be something that they've dug out or maybe a naturally formed cave or they wiped out a dwarven, you know, uh, mining place and that's where they've made their nest and their hoard is stored there. But that access to the mountains, I think, is kind of part of the core of the identity of the red dragon. And even in the red dragon's lair section, they, they talk about 
like having their lair high in mountains or hills, dwelling in caverns under snow-capped snow peaks, or within the deep halls of abandoned mines and dwarven strongholds. Caves with volcanic or geothermal activity are the most highly prized red dragon lairs, creating hazards that hinder intruders, blah, blah, blah. Um, I also want to say, like, you know, you could have a completely different climate going on in wherever your campaign setting is, but still cleverly use red dragons, right? So if you don't want it to be at a snow-packed keep uh, peak, snow-capped peak, or in a really mountainous area, maybe there's like an island, you know? Maybe you have kind of more of like a uh, Mediterranean kind of island setting, and there's a volcano, you know, amongst the cluster of islands or out on a peninsula, and there's islands around it, and a red dragon has kind of made their home in this dormant volcano. Um, and then you could kind of even bring up sort of jungle adventures to tie in with that. So it doesn't, I don't want you to think like the only way to use a red dragon is in mountains, because that's what I want to get away from. I, I think it's cool that you could do that to fall back on it, but, but try to think outside of the box, like how can you integrate red dragons outside of that mountain range setting? And that's, you know, one example would be an island or a peninsula um, where there's jungle and a volcano that's dormant or semi-active, and that's kind of the home base for the red dragons. Um, they have crazy powerful stats. Like all the dragons, though, in 5th edition, they're all kind of balanced out, right? The red dragon wormlings uh, have an AC of 17. They have a bite attack that's plus six to hit, 1d6 fire damage, plus 1d10 plus four piercing damage, ouch. That's just a baby. And fire breath on a recharge of five to six. Um, and that exhales fire in a 15 foot cone, DC 13 dex save, or they take 7d6 fire damage on a fail save. The young red dragon, as all the other dragons have so far, scales up a little bit. The AC jumps up to 18, um, they get multi-attack, so one bite attack and two claw attacks. Um, the bite attack and the claw attacks are, you know, relatively well scaled. The fire breath jumps up pretty significantly, so it goes to a 30-foot cone. Uh, DC to save on that is 17 for the young red dragon, and you take 16 D6 fire damage. Um, just spitting the napalm. The adult red dragon is mighty fearful. Uh, they have legendary resistance, like all the adult dragons. They have a multi-attack. They have frightful presence, bite, claw, tail, um, fire that recharges in a 60-foot cone, DC 21 to save, and 18 D6 fire damage. Then they have legendary actions, too. They can detect. They can do a tail attack. They can do a wing attack. Um, and if you haven't seen the other videos on dragons, you can kind of look at those to see how those work. That is consistent with all the other dragon types so far. The ancient red dragon. Good lord, why would any DM throw this at a player, a uh, group of players? Well, because when you're really high level, you want to, you know, create something that's going to be a challenge. Um, ancient red dragons are fearful uh, because they have all of the powers. And their fire is a 90-foot cone, DC 24 to save, 26 D6 damage. That's a lot of dice to roll. Dragons, especially these red dragons, um, you can avoid them, right? So if you were a party and you knew there was a dra red dragon in the area, uh, unless you were really hungry for treasure, you'd probably avoid the red dragon, no matter what age they are, because you're, you're going up against a powerful foe. And that's why I think one way that you could take red dragons out of this mountainous element, or even in my like side suggestion of having like the volcano on the peninsula kind of thing. And by the way, every time I mention that, for some reason I think of like the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico and kind of like the jungly area. Uh, I guess in D&D, &D, like in Forgotten Realms, that would be like your chult, right? And Maybe that kind of jungle setting isn't what you normally associate with a red dragon. Maybe you associate that with a black dragon or green dragon. I don't know. But just food for thought that, like, basically you could plunk a volcano or a single mountain somewhere, almost anywhere, and have that be a dragon 
uh, layer. So their layer actions are crazy, you guys. I mean, layer actions in general are pretty insane, but like, check this out. Magma erupts from a point on the ground the dragon can see within 120 feet of it, creating a 20 foot high, five foot radius geyser. Each creature in the geyser's area must make a DC 15 deck save, taking 66 fire damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. A tremor, so that's the first one. A tremor shakes the lair in a 60 foot radius around the dragon. Each creature other than the dragon on the ground must make a DC 15 deck save or be knocked prone. Volcanic gases form a cloud in a 20 foot radius sphere centered on a point the dragon can see within 120 feet of it. The sphere spreads around corners and its area is lightly obscured. It lasts until initiative count 20 on the next round. Each creature that starts its turn in the cloud must succeed on a DC 13 con save or be poisoned. While poisoned in this way, a creature is incapacitated. Man. So not only do they have fire, but should you dare to go into their lair and go after that big old horde of treasure, you're dealing with poison damage as well. Hmm. Regional effects. The region containing a legendary red dragon's lair is warped by the dragon's magic, which creates one or more of the following effects. Small earthquakes are common within six miles of the dragon's lair. Water sources within one mile of the lair are supernaturally warm and tainted by sulfur. Rocky fissures within one mile of the dragon's lair form portals to the elemental plane of fire, allowing creatures of elemental fire into the world to dwell nearby. So it, it might not necessarily have like fire elemental minions, but that opens up an option where you could have various kind of fire elemental or like uh, like the methods that are from the elemental plane of fire, that kind of stuff. Um, also to kind of elaborate and embellish on your adventure should you have a high level party that wants to go to get that dragon stuff. Red dragons, I, I wanted to talk about this too because in terms of thinking about how to use a red dragon, you wanna also think about who they might ally themselves with or like have as servants. Red dragons are fiercely territorial and isolationist. However, they yearn to know about events in the wider world and they make use of lesser creatures as informants, messengers, and spies. They're most interested in news about other red dragons with which they compete constantly for status. When it requires servants, a red dragon demands fealty from chaotic evil humanoids. If allegiance isn't forthcoming, it slaughters a tribe's leaders and claims lordship over the survivors. Creatures serving a red dragon live in constant terror of being roasted and eaten for displeasing it. They spend most of their time fawning over the creature in an attempt to stay alive. They covet anything of monetary value and can often judge the worth of a bauble to within a copper piece at a glance. A red dragon has a special affection for treasure claimed from powerful enemies it has slain, exhibiting that treasure to prove its superiority. A red dragon knows the value and provenance of every item in its hoard, along with each item's exact location. It might notice the absence of a single coin, igniting its rage as it tracks down and slays the thief without mercy. If the thief can't be found, the dragon goes on a rampage. That's a little story hook right there. So even if you don't have a party who's like, yeah, let's, let's go raid the dragon's horde, you can come up with a situation where a group of NPCs tried to do it and failed, or maybe like several of them got torched and one or two of them got away, and now you have this like ticked off red dragon who's gonna go on a rampage, and the party just happens to be collateral damage, like, and, and they rise to the occasion being the heroes that they are, and help defend this nearby town in the shadow of the mountains from this attack from the red dragon. Um, so what other kind of variations can we do with red dragons? Uh, I, I was, I'm kind of thinking about this, and, and again, aside from kind of the volcano islands component, um, I don't see red dragons having allies who manipulate them. I think it's more about a red dragon having servants who serve it but I do like one little component of this, and that was the idea that red dragons are actually so competitive that they're not just looking out for enemies, 
they consider their own kind to be enemies, right? Their own kind to be potential threats or at least competition. So I guess, you know, another variation would be what if you had two young red dragons from like different clutches, you know, from different nests or families or regions, whatever, two red dragons who kind of were vying for control of this specific region. And both of those red dragons, you know, hated each other, uh, were in competition with each other for wealth, resources, service. And the party somehow gets caught up in that, right? Either as heroes who are like, oh my gosh, our region's being attacked by multiple dragons. Or somehow um, as servants or reluctant servants to one of the two dragons who are then like commanded basically, I'm going to say blackmailed, extorted, blackmailed. into like serving that dragon. Maybe it's like to save the town, you know, like the dragon gives them an ultimatum. Like either you will go spy on my enemy or recover this valuable gem from my enemy or I'm going to torch this whole town. So they're not really willingly evil and serving a red dragon, but they're kind of doing it because there's no other choice. I think pitting two red dragons against each other in your adventure sequence could be another cool option too. And I, I wouldn't go heavy with that. Like adult, two adult red dragons against, you know, and a party's caught between them is, that's, that's pretty brutal. Um, you're talking about some pretty high level stuff there. But even young red dragons are, are to be feared for sure. Um, and I, would, I wouldn't do that with anybody like under eighth level. I'm thinking like a really resourceful, uh, experienced party from like eight to 12th level or 10th to 15th level. You could throw that into the mix. But one more variation, because I do like to think of how you could do things at lower level or mid level. And I mentioned the whole idea of like a clutch of red dragons, you know, so this mother red dragon has, I don't know, roll 1d6 and add one, that many wormlings, right? So let's say you have four or five of these little wormling red dragons who are just kind of running around terrorizing this mountain range and all the little valleys on the mainland below. Um, and nobody even knows, you know, if the adult red dragon, the mother, is even around because they haven't seen any evidence of that. So you as a DM maybe come up with this concept that the mother, after having the children, is in like a deep torpor-like sleep. And, you know, so these little wormlings have to fend for themselves. So they're kind of out eating things, burning things down, you know, stealing, acquiring treasure. And the party kind of has to fundamentally do some investigation to figure out that the adult red dragon um, is sleeping or something and make a decision about the red dragon wormlings. Are they just gonna hunt them down and kill them all one by one? And then what do you do after that? Does the mother wake up finding that all of her babies are killed and now wreak total rampage and havoc? That might be a bit too much. So I thought of a variation on my own variation, which is this. What if the adult red dragon mother died in childbirth so now she has a bunch of red dragon wormlings who are just wandering around creating chaos. Or the red dragon mother had the wormlings and a much more powerful party of heroes came along and slayed that adult red dragon mother. So now there's just these wormlings running around. And the lower level or mid-level party that you have in your campaign kind of has cleanup duty. And they have to decide if they're going to try to capture these things and somehow, you know, I mean, maybe they'll be resourceful and they're like, let's capture them and retrain them and, and make them our allies. And maybe you'll let that happen if they're really smart about it and, you know, successful with their strategies and stuff. Or maybe they're not going to be trainable. Maybe they, you know, they bring in these wild red dragon wormlings. They, they, they keep them in captivity, but all the while these red dragon wormlings keep getting bigger. They need to eat more and they're just fierce and they start like eating the zookeepers. I don't know, there are a lot of options there. And I mean, yes, I even said zoo, because in a sense, like one thing you could have is a juxtaposition where the humanoid society is actually pretty evil. 
like lawful evil. And then you've got chaotic evil red dragons flying around and maybe the lawful evil humanoid society, whatever, wherever the setting is, you know, tropical jungles with volcanoes or mountains somewhere. Um, maybe they captured these wormling red dragons. And now your party is kind of caught up in this mix of like, what do we do? Do we try to release them back in the wild, knowing full well that they'll continue to grow and become fierce creatures and, and death? Or do we try to, you know, put them out of their misery? I don't know. So you can even add some like little moral quandary issues into the adventures if you, if you want. Um, last but not least, you can always take a dragon out of its intended element. And here's how. They covet wealth. They covet things, right? Now, not just any like bag of gold. So you have to come up with like a clever... Um, prop, right? Something important, something of extreme value. Um, maybe, right, there's a young red dragon whose mother or father, the adult red dragon, was slain by this hero, this legendary hero, many years ago. And that young red dragon is now, you know, old enough and big enough to kind of do its own justice. And it goes after that hero and slays that hero. And that hero maybe had a very special magical item that helped defend the city of blah, blah, blah in the kingdom of blah, blah, blah from, you know, evil creatures, right? Maybe it had certain radiant or divine properties. Um, and so the dragon kills that hero, takes that sword or that weapon, whatever it is. It could be a wand, a staff, um, takes the magical artifact back to its horde. And now the party's kind of in this position where they're like, oh man, you know, we're all in mourning because the old great champion so-and-so was killed by the offspring of his, you know, arch nemesis who he slayed many years ago in the legend of blah, blah, blah. What do we do? Um, and then you integrate another faction, right? Maybe there's like demons or there's a cult who wants to bring demons into the city and they've opened up a portal and the one item that had the powers to close that portal is the thing that the red dragon took. I mean, that's kind of convoluted, but I think you get the point, right? You create a magical thing that's really important and worth a lot of money and then you have a dragon come and take it so that the party is kind of compelled to try to recover the item. Whether they slay the dragon to do it, whether they just Bilbo Baggins into there and snatch it and get out, that's up to them, all right? Leave it open-ended, let your players have agency, but you, you create a conflict, you create a situation where it's not in the mountains, it could just be in any city anywhere, but the dragon came there specifically to get a thing, which that thing is important. So however you wanna arrange it, I think there's really a lot of options for how you can use a red dragon um, in a game in almost any location. It could be a, you know, icy snow covered north, even though that's gonna be kind of our next episode, but it, it could really be anywhere. And red dragons are cool because they're chaotic evil, they're classic, they're iconic, they're bad guys. I'm really not gonna try to sell you on an idea of like the redemption of the red dragon. It, it's kind of a tough sell, you know what I mean? Um, I don't see them as having some arc in your campaign where, actually, you know what? Because I'm clever, I could see this. I'm going to throw this one more morsel at you. This video is kind of running long, but it, it just hit me. Rewind to that red dragon wormling thing. Suppose that you have a party who wants to, to like save or spare the red dragon wormling from death. And, and despite the orders from the kingdom, they don't kill the red dragon wormling. They let it go. Years later in your campaign, that red dragon wormling is now older. And it's still wild. It's still innately a savage, mean creature. But when it re-encounters the party, it has that like moment. You know those videos on like YouTube where like um, the wild lion that was released back into the wild from captivity remembers his zookeeper from 20 years ago, that kind of stuff, right? 
Like maybe the red dragon flies up and it's just torching things, but then it sees that one person or those people in the party who had treated it kindly and maybe gave it its freedom. And, and they're not dumb, they're smart creatures. But it, it like swoops back around and it kind of stops and like looks at them and smells them and stuff. You know, and then I'm not saying it's gonna be like, hop on my back and I'll be your buddy now. It's not gonna be like the NPC who adventures with them, but it could be a kind of a cool little emotional hook and maybe even a reward for players who think about other ways to solve problems other than just killing things. I leave that to you. Come up with your own ideas. And obviously, if you're a player and you've got a great Red Dragon story, share it in the comments below. If you're a DM, you've used um, Red Dragons effectively, share that or share any other scenarios or, or variations on how to use Red Dragons in the comments. We always love uh, when our community members share those things and I try to read the comments on every video. So thank you again for watching. I wanna say a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon for all of your support. It has really meant a lot to me very much, especially in the last uh, six months. So I wanna say thank you to all my patrons, but to all of you guys who are subscribers, thank you for liking my videos, for spreading the word and for all of your support. Have a great one.